So in this last video, I want to talk about protein structure. What do proteins look like? Proteins have an unparalleled diversity in size, shape, and chemical properties. So they look very different from one another. And proteins serve diverse functions in the cell because structure gives rise to functions. So they, because they can look so different, they can have a lot of different functions. So here's just some examples of different shaped proteins. So we have collagen that kind of winds around each other to, in strands to create this fibrous protein. We have this TATA binding box protein that, that has a spot for it to bind DNA because this protein binds DNA. This is porin, it has a donut shaped, um, so it can create a pore, right, that things can go through. And then we have this globular protein that its shape doesn't really tell us a lot about what it does. So these ones are a little bit harder to predict what the function is by just looking at the shape. So protein structure can be um, protein structure can be grouped into four different categories: primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So primary structure is characterized by peptide bonds. So here we have um, uh, the illegal peptide that we've used in a couple of these videos. We've got our glycines, right? And each one of these has a peptide bond. So just this sequence, whatever the sequence of amino acids is starting from the start to the end is the primary sequence, right? So it's only joined by these peptide bonds that are indicated here by these purple arrows. The primary structure is essential to the higher levels of protein, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And the amino acid R groups affect the proper, because the amino acid R groups affect the properties and function of a protein. So in a single amino acid mutation at one site can drastically change the, the protein's function. For example, if you take um, the, the mutation that causes sickle cell, right, so here you have um, glutamate and it's mutated to valine, this protein will change, this hemoglobin will change in such a way that we go from having a normal red blood cell that can carry oxygen to having the sickle cell um, red blood cell that, that is very poor at carrying oxygen. So just this single amino acid mutation can drastically alter the shape and function of a protein. Secondary structure is formed now by hydrogen bonds between the backbones of different amino acids. So it's the carbonyl of one amino acid and the amino group of another one. So here's what that looks like. It's characterized by hydrogen bonds to the backbone. So our carboxyl group of one amino acid and a amino group of another one. And that's just shown again here. So here's the hydrogen bond, and here's another hydrogen bond. And this secondary structure, this hydrogen bonding, can give us two shapes. It can give us this helical shape, where every 3.4 amino acids, there's this interaction here between the backbone of one amino of one amino group and one carboxyl group in the in the backbone of a, of an amino acid. And we get this spiral shape that's often represented in this ribbon diagram as, a, as a, a little ribbon spiral. And this is the helix. Or we can get these beta pleated sheets in which the protein kind of folds over and they bond diagonally um, between um, the sheets. And we represent that by this, these arrowheads to kind of point to the direction that we're going. So this is secondary structure. It's really dictated by hydrogen bonds in the backbone. The tertiary structure is characterized by R group interactions. So we talked a little bit about this um, when we talked about the R groups. So here's our primary structure based on peptides, our secondary structure, amino acid or hydrogen bonding, right, that gives us alpha helices or beta sheets. And now we're up to our 3D shape. Okay, so this is all, these are all glycines, right? So these are nonpolar, they just have the hydrogen. And as we talked about, those nonpolar right, groups are going to cluster into the center of the protein, right? So we're already forming a 3D structure based on the R groups. There are five important interactions in the formation of R groups. There's hydrogen bonds between polar side chains and opposite charges. There's hydrophobic interactions. And accompanying those are the van der Waals interactions. We've talked about these. 
the covalent uh, disulfide bonds that form between sulfohydro groups, and ionic bonds that form between groups with opposing charges. So these are the, these are the interactions that dictate that 3D um, structure. And so we've already shown this, this figure here in a different video, but you can see here we have secondary structure depicted up here in these, in these uh, as an alpha helices and down here, but then you also have those R groups participating in hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bonds, and ionic bonds. And the tertiary structures are diverse, so you can, you can end up with a lot of different shapes of a protein. Maybe this protein has all alpha helices, but then it's also clustered together. This one has a mix, and, um, and this one is rich in disulfide bonds that really pack it in together with covalent bonds. The quaternary structure is when two polypeptides, two distinct polypeptides, interact with each other. Okay, Some of these contain molecular machines or groups of multiple proteins that carry out a particular function. So the, the CRO protein is a dimer made up of two peptides, and hemoglobin that we talked about um, when we talked about sickle cell is actually made of, of distinct four distinct polypeptides that then come together. And only when those all four of those subunits come together is the protein now functional. Okay, so I wanna show you some experimental evidence that demonstrated that protein folding was necessary for protein function. So these experiments were done a long time ago by Christian Anfinson, and he was studying this protein shown here called ribonuclease. And what this protein did is it degraded um, RNA. It was a ribonuclease. And so this protein has a lot of disulfide bonds, which are shown here, this sulfur-sulfur bond, and a lot of hydrogen bonding. And what he did was he showed that when he added this um, chemical that was able to break apart these disulfide bonds and break apart hydrogen bonds, this protein was unfolded, or we call this being denatured. And when this happened, the ribonuclease lost its function. It was no longer able to break apart these RNA molecules into individual uh, monomers. And so this was strong evidence that protein function depends on folding. There's another interesting um, thing that some proteins can do. And so these are prion proteins. And so um, an example of a prion protein is this PRP. This is the prion protein that causes mad cow disease. And this is what the normal prion protein looks like. It has four alpha helices in this protein. But something happened to, to this protein where some of these alpha helices turn into beta sheets. And this can cause disease. It can also, once this infectious prion protein is in the brain, like in mad cow, it will also cause other normal prion proteins to convert to this alternate conformation with these beta pleated sheets. And so this is how a protein is infectious. And this is, this is a really interesting um, example of it affecting the secondary structure instead of the tertiary structure. So obviously protein folding is really important and it's not, it's a very spontaneous process. So proteins will fold because it's energetically favorable to make sure those hydrophobic amino acids or those hydrophobic uh, R groups are sequestered away from water. But there's lots of water in the cell and proteins are made gradually from RNA. And so there are these molecular chaperones, these are other proteins, that when a protein is getting made, it will actually bind to these non-polar side chains, these hydrophobic amino acids, and sequester them and basically let them eventually help them to fold up into their 3D conformation, which will help the protein then be functional. So proteins, once properly folded, they have a lot of different functions, and we're going to talk about a lot of these through the quarter. Um, in the next unit, we're going to be talking about protein catalysis. And so this is basically proteins that help with chemical reactions. And so here's an example of a protein enzyme in this gray blob here. And um, there's some important points of this protein.
And that important point that I want to show you is called the active site. And this is where different protein substrates or chemical substrates bind and the chemical reaction takes place. And this is often called the lock and key model because the shape of this enzyme can only accommodate certain proteins, just like only locks can accommodate certain keys. So we'll talk more about this next class. The next function I want to talk about for proteins is structure. And so there's a lot of important structural proteins. An example of one of these is the protein keratin that can um, that is in your fingernails, right? That makes up structure. We have proteins that participate in movement. We have proteins that can contract and we have motor proteins and these help our muscles move and contract and our heart to beat. We have proteins that function in signaling. So for example, there's a protein called glucagon and this binds to a protein receptor on cells. And this happens when blood sugar is low and it sends a signal to release more sugar into the blood. And so this is a very important signaling pathway and we'll talk about this later in the quarter. We also have proteins that function in transport. So we've already talked about one of these proteins like hemoglobin that can transport oxygen throughout the body. And then the final category of proteins are proteins that function in defense. So something like an antibody that binds to a pathogen and prevents it from causing disease. We have a lot of defense proteins include, in addition to antibodies like the complement system. And this is something that I studied when I was an undergraduate. So just to summarize, we have our primary, right, which is the sequence of amino acids and a polypeptide stabilized by peptide bonds. We have secondary formation of hydrogen bonds in the backbone, right, so here's an alpha helix, but we also can get beta pleated sheets. Tertiary is the overall three-dimensional shape. It's um, formed by interactions between R groups. And then finally, the quaternary structure, which is formed when multiple polypeptides interact. So that's all for today, and I look forward to seeing you in class. Thanks. Bye.